you would open your Bibles to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and we're in chapter 1, I'm continuing to teach through the, the life and times of Jesus Christ according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four Gospels. Today we happen to be in this wonderful book written by Dr. Luke, and before we uh, pray and will be standing. When you found that place, just stand with me for reading the word. I wanted to tell you some updates. One, George Vaginaru uh, fell and he shattered his pelvis. And he is uh, was at the hospital and now he is in manor care. And his precious wife, Irma, was in the choir this morning. I thought, what faithfulness that is. That's wonderful. And so we need to pray for George and we need to pray for Irma. And then uh, Duke and Carol, Duke would have been here to pray for the offering this morning, but he and Carol are in disaster relief training, and they're down at the Stram camp. So they're uh, getting some training down there for Southern Baptist disaster relief, and that's a wonderful thing that, that our convention does. And then the last thing I wanted to share with you, what's going on in our family. Uh, our, uh, the, the father of our grandchildren carries... Uh, our daughter Carrie is the mother, and Paul is in the hospital. He is in the hospital in, in uh, Redlands, and he is in intensive care. Uh, he is a medical directive, and he is asked not to continue uh, support. But the cancer that he had has come back, and uh, he is facing, it would appear, uh, the end of this life. But he is a believer, and he, had, he and I talked last week, I guess it was the week before last, and uh, last week, but when we talked, we had a reassurance of his faith in Jesus Christ, his awareness that he will be going to heaven when he leaves this life, and uh, he did not want to continue to be supported by life support equipment, so um, I just want to know there's things going on there, but I have to give thanks to God that he has faith in Jesus Christ, and so we know that uh, We'll see him again. The kids will see him again. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we just thank you for your word. As we prepare to read it, I am so thankful that you love us despite our sin. And you have good plans for us in this life and in the rest of eternal life when we, when we meet you face to face. I want to pray for uh, Paul that the will of God might be done in his life. Be gracious, please, to him and bring comfort to him and to uh, the family and friends who are around him. And uh, we uh, want to pray for Duke and Carol while they're away today that they might learn what they need so they can minister to others. If there is a disaster, they will be better prepared. And we pray for George and Irma Baginari. We know George fell and he's uh, undoubtedly in a lot of pain today, but we just pray you bring healing upon him. And now, Lord, we beg you, speak to us through your word, because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're in Luke chapter 1, and I'm beginning at verse 26. But when she saw him, that is, when Mary saw Gabriel, excuse me, I'm, I'm too on my head. Verse 26, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you, blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also 
That Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for who who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You may be seated. Wow. Any of you had an angel show up at your place and give you a message like that? She hadn't either. Very few people have received a messenger from God like that. Here she is, a young woman, engaged to be married. Gabriel, an archangel of God, who stands in the presence of God himself, appears to this young girl and tells her, I got some news for you, your life is going to change. It's going to change dramatically from what you thought it was going to be. The Son of God is going to be born through you and come into this life. The Messiah for whom the Jews had been waiting for centuries for him to come. And she's the one that was chosen to be the birth mother of the Son of God. A startling announcement to her, this young lady. You have to kind of get out of who you and I are and think about Maybe an older teenage girl, I don't know, a young woman, certainly a virgin, certainly a woman who never been married, never had a child, and she gets this kind of news. And her, her response is not too surprising, because whenever the unexpected happens, it's our nature to become troubled, or fearful, or anxious, or confused. So when it's said in the sixth month, that was in the... the the sixth month, that, uh, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And to this virgin bet engaged, betrothed is engaged to a man named who, whose name was Joseph, Joseph the carpenter, who was in the lineage of the house of David, and her name was Mary. And having said that, the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, but... When she saw him, don't miss that, she was troubled at his saying. She was troubled at what he said to her and, he, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Do you know that fear has been part of the existence of mankind since the beginning? Oh, since the beginning when man sinned against God. There wasn't any fear before that. But when man sinned against God, anxiety, Fear, trembling came into the heart of mankind and man has struggled with fear and anxiety since up to this day. One of the great struggles that people have, any psychologist or psychiatrist would tell you, one of the great struggles that people have is fear or anxiety, anxiety attacks. And fear can lead to many other symptoms like anger or a desire to flee, to escape, or to lash out at others. And so when you see people lashing out at others or being unwilling to trust others, and a lot of that has to do with the human nature. When we're anxious and we don't understand, we want to defend ourselves. It's like when you don't know what's going to happen or you don't understand it, that would be natural. In Mary's case, she just had an honest and sincere trouble understanding what he said. I am sure she wasn't prepared for this moment in the sense of I'm waiting for the message. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 says, And Adam and Eve were in the, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. By the way, that's the first time they hid. Before, the, before they sinned, they didn't have any need to hide. God would come to the garden. Can you imagine this? God comes to the garden, walks around, and they can communicate with God because they had no sin. So they could stand before a holy God. No sin. 
How good is that? Perfect. Then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? It's just God didn't know. So he said, Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. These guys had never been afraid. They could talk to God. They could eat all, the, all they wanted to. I like that. Of the, of the trees and the fruit in the garden of Eden. I mean, life was good. But when they listened to the serpent and ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, from that moment, conviction of sin came upon them and they were in fear. And you can see what fear looks like. You know, there's a driver, what is it, a student driver. Yeah. Now, fear is not in the eyes of the people standing on the street. They're just kind of puzzled and curious. And I don't think fear was in the eyes of the, the face of the student driver. You know who had the fear? The instructor who was sitting in the passenger and who didn't have control of the car. Anybody here been a driver's ed teacher? Anybody? Yeah, you've been. You, you've trained truck drivers. That's even bigger and more dangerous. Two times national, was it two times national driver of the year? Yeah. Yeah, you know about this. <laughs> he taught safety. And so, you think about it, you think, you know, a lot of people are afraid. Are you, anybody in here afraid of snakes? Oh, spiders? Spider, don't like spiders. Okay. How, how about disease? Anybody afraid of disease? Financial difficulties? Can you guess what I'm afraid of? I open the refrigerator and it's... There's nothing in the refrigerator. Uh, that's a nightmare. It's never happened. I live in America. So, <laughs> that's not my problem. But people have anxieties, don't they, about all different kinds of things. And what might be your anxiety, someone else might not understand. And what's theirs, you might think is crazy. But when our lives don't go as we expect they should, or they don't go the way we plan, it causes us to have some fear, uh, or because we don't understand what's going to happen. I think everyone in here could identify with that. And when unexpected things come, it's always easy to question the Lord and question His judgment. So, understanding helps a great deal, doesn't it? One of the reasons it's important for you and I to read the Bible on a regular basis is so we can be prepared to understand what's going on. If you want to know about what's going on in the world today, you read about it in many places in the New Testament. And you can see things that are happening today were prophesied 2,000 years ago and more. And so there's nothing that's happening today that should be a shock to you and me. And we should be better prepared by just knowing, ah, what's happening actually confirms that the Word of God is true. And so it shouldn't really surprise you or me what's going on in the world today. But when we don't understand, if you don't read the Bible and you're not prayed up and you don't prepare, then it's easy to be afraid. What she faced, no one had ever faced before. There was no one she could have received instruction from. It. Now, dearie, this is what's going to happen. Nobody knew. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Yeshua. Mary knew because it was in Hebrew. Yeshua means God is my salvation. The, the one who's going to be in, my, in the womb of Mary is God, is my salvation, Yeshua, the one who saves us from our sin. And uh, he will be great, and he will be called Son of the Highest. Son of the Highest is, the, is an expression that means the Son of God himself. There's none higher than God, right? So if he's Son of the Highest, he has to be the Son of God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Now that's all fulfillment of prophecy. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Jacob is also Israel, right? And his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be? 
since I don't know a man. Her question was not a challenge of I don't believe you. Zacharias had a different kind of question, which was kind of like disbelief, like I can't believe this is possible. With her, it was more of a question of how? How could, how could this come to be? It has to be because she wasn't chastised for her question. You can ask God questions. Did you know if you don't understand something and you believe God and it's your heart's desire to obey God but you just don't understand, it's okay to ask God questions. You say, God, I love you and I want to obey you, but I'm not smart enough to understand how to do what you're asking me to do. So I need you to show me or, or, or bring somebody in my life that can help me to understand how to do what you're asking me to do. That's not challenging God in disbelief. That's saying, God, help. I'll do everything you ask me to do, but I need someone to come along to help me understand what you just said to me. And God will honor that. If you ask God a sincere question in faith, God will answer that. So don't be afraid to ask questions of God, okay? <laughs> and so uh, God sent these angels with messages to different ones throughout the Bible. And every time a messenger came to someone like Mary, it often troubled the person or caused them to be afraid. For example, in Joshua's case, when he was being told what he was going to do, three times, I think, it says, be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid. The Lord will be with you. Don't be afraid. So even Joshua, brave as he was, who had been at the right hand of, of uh, Moses throughout the wilderness wandering, even Joshua, a man of great faith and boldness and courage in Christ, and I mean in God, and courage in God the same, even Joshua needed to be told, don't be afraid, be of strong and of good courage. And there were a lot of men in history, uh, Greek history, Roman history, but there's no comparison between any other man and Jesus Christ. Luke 16, 15, Jesus said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Sometimes we, we have people we are afraid of or we respect or we look up to, and the truth is when they're worldly, we shouldn't really be afraid of them. And if they're worldly, then that's all they have. Uh, yeah, you can learn some stuff from them, but be careful who you listen to and be careful what you accept because it might not be true. You might get used. But this son of Mary, the angel Gabriel tells her, is going to be great. Luke 9, 48 says, Whoever receives this little child in my name, guess the subject, pride and humility. Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all will be great. The least among you all is a person who is humble. He didn't say weak, weak. He just said humble, meek. A person who says, I'm not all that. God is all that. It's about God. Doesn't mean you're weak. It just means you realize who God is and you're submitted to him. Jesus was teaching his disciples about humility versus pride. I think that one of the reasons God chose Mary, among many reasons that God chose her, was her humility. She was a young woman. She had never had children before. She wasn't married yet. She was engaged. But she did trust God. She believed God. And she was a pure woman. She was a young woman. She had a virtuous woman, you might say. And he was teaching, Jesus was the disciples about humility versus pride. And this is a problem in churches everywhere, isn't it? When pride right raises up its ugly head, people begin to think it's about me. Or I'm better than others are. Or did you see what they did? Or what they wore? Or who the, whatever? And we begin, without thinking of it, we began looking down on other people thinking I'm better than they are. When we need to remember all the time, but for the grace of God, there I would be in the ditch. For the grace of God, I would be nothing. It's all about the grace of God and His love and His provision, His personal relationship in our life. 
You know what feeds pride is when you associate yourself with those who are important. Partly because you want to be around important people so that it kind of rubs off. Humility is fed by association with the lowly. Be kind. This is an instruction. Be kind to the people that society considers to be unimportant. Be kind to the least. God will never chasten you for being humble and gracious and kind to someone who needs help and just can't do it for themselves. You come alongside that person and give them a hand up. God will see that. And when you do it for God's glory, tell them. Somebody reached me with the truth. What I have received, I freely give to you. Do you know Jesus? Witness. Tell people about Christ and what he's done for you. Well, Mary's situation, she was a humble woman, and she was engaged to a good man named Joseph, who was a carpenter. And when the angel told her that she was going to become pregnant with the son of the highest, the son of God, she knew that Joseph might not understand why his engaged spouse-to-be is now pregnant. He would have the legal right under the law to declare her as unfaithful, pregnant, while she was engaged to be married to him. He could even ask the elders of the city to have her stoned at the gate for having violated her commitment to be engaged to him and him alone. And even if Joseph would still marry her, she, Mary, knew how people would still talk. People talk, especially about what they don't know. Why is it that people wax eloquent about what they don't know? and look down on other people and judge other people's motives without knowing the motive or without talking to that person and seeing their heart without realizing that I, a sinner, was forgiven by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ and I don't deserve to be forgiven. So who in the world would I think I am to look down on someone else and to, put, uh, to gossip about someone else and talk about someone? I'm not dealing here with the problem that's going on in this church. I want you to know right now, I am grateful to be pastor of this church. This is a wonderful church family. I see so much love and care and concern and kindness going on in our church. But when I preach, I have to preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. And what I see in this passage is some opportunity to make us more aware. When you ever see something like that happening... We need to go to somebody in privately and we need to say, brother, sister, you may not realize what you're doing, but when you talk about a brother or sister, you can really hurt a brother or sister. And sometimes we don't even know what we're talking about. We think we know. Have you gone to them and talked to them about it? It's best to be kind to others, especially when we don't know everything and we'll never know everything. God won't challenge us to do something just for fun, though. Sometimes he allows problems to come into our life, and he, he doesn't always pressure us to fit in with the crowd. Did you know that God loves you and he loves me, and he always wants what's best for our life? All the time. God isn't going to manipulate us and trick us. and He never deceives us. He's not going to deceive us into doing something that's wrong so that he can then uh, hurt us, embarrass us, kick us to the curb, that's not God. It might be somebody else. God always wants what's best for our life. So when God comes to you and you feel you're reading the scripture and you see that it says, I need to do this or I shouldn't do that, you can trust that it's always because God knows what's best for us. Individually and in relationship with others, he always goes to what's best. What he does is when God allows trouble to come into your life, any of you ever have trouble? You go through a hard time and you feel about like the rock that's under the dirt. It's like you feel so bad about what's happening in your life. Do you know why God allows us to go through hard times? 
I don't think I know all the reasons why. But some of the reasons why he allows trouble is to cause us to run to God more often and more completely. Causes us to get on our knees more when we're going through hard times than we would have if everything was just going our way. Sometimes he allows us to go through hard times to prepare us to know how others go through hard times so we're able to minister to them with more grace and compassion. You ever thought about that? Sometimes you're going through a hard time. It's not about you necessarily. It's about teaching you so that you're able to minister to someone else with more humility and grace and compassion. Right? He's trying to develop his character in you and me. How did people treat Jesus? They treated him like dirt. They made false accusations about him. They didn't understand who he was, the son of God himself. They, they accused him of sin, and he's never known sin, never done sin, ever, and never will. They've said all kinds of things about Jesus. So don't be shocked when things happen in your life, because if you're like becoming more like Jesus, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, for me as a Christian, I have to say it's fortunate. He allows me to go through things so I experience it, so I can understand it. When I see someone else going through it, don't you have more compassion for someone who's going through what you're going through? There's a lot of people in America today going through a lot of hard times. People having time, hard time finding work. People who've lost their homes. People who have gone through really challenging times in their life more than you and I can ever begin to comprehend if you haven't ever gone through it. But when a person, a brother or sister, goes through something like that, as much as it pains me to say it, the wonderful thing is you always come out being better fit to minister to someone else in the, in the grace of Jesus Christ. I wouldn't wish that on anyone, but I know that's the only way you can become more mature, is to go through things, some of the things he allows in our life. And you know what's wonderful? Is when you get the lesson, he always lifts you up and says, okay, you got the lesson. <laughs> now let me provide for you and minister to your wounds and care for you, and then I've got... So not something else for you to learn. <laughs> That's what he always does. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 talks about Jesus. Oh, and before we get there, I was thinking about how do you go through life. You know, Mary said, how? I forgot this. Mary said, how is this going to happen? And I thought about this too. I think I mentioned it last week. The Word of God, it's like the most powerful flashlight. It never needs batteries. It always has light. It never runs out of light. And it shows me light in two ways. One, like the lamp that the young lady's carrying. It shows me where it walks as she walks around the puddle that's in the road or she doesn't step into a hole and break her ankle. It shows you where to step, how to walk in your life, step by step. It also, the Word of God is a light that shows you the path that you should be walking so you're not just walking lost aimlessly through life. So the Word of God is like a, a, a light that shows us where to go and it also helps you to take step by step through life so you don't get yourself in trouble with the steps that you and I make through life, okay? That's Psalm 1, 119, 105. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So when you get to know and you trust the Word of God, you know what happens. It's what Mary did. You submit to God's will. Would you really know the Word of God? You understand that you can trust God. I mean, you can tr really trust God. Not just believe about God, but you can trust Him. You can lean on God with your whole life and say, I am yours, and I surrender my heart, soul, mind, and strength to you, God. And you, you are God, and I belong to you, and I'm thankful that you hold me and you'll never let me go, you'll never let me down. Are you there? Are you to the place in your own life where you can say, you know God, I trust you, my life is yours, whatever you allow in my life, I trust you, thank you for guiding me, thank you for holding my hand, thank you for comforting me when I really need it. I hope you're there. If you're not there, would you talk to God about that and say, oh God, I need to have that kind of simple Simple faith. It says the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit, she answered her question, 
will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you, and therefore also that Holy One who is to be born, Jesus, will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has conceived a son in her old age. This is the sixth month for her that was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. What a response. She knew what the word was. She trusted God's word. And she submitted herself to obey the word of God. That took faith. That took enormous faith for her to just say, Okay, <coughs> behold, I am the servant of God. I, what I am, all that I have, is God's. Let it be. Let's let her what she said. Let it be. And then Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 told us about this child who's going to be born. And it was a prophecy. Isaiah wrote this about 700 years before the angel showed up and talked to Mary. Unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And in the increase of his government and of his peace there will be no end. Until the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. A prophecy that was going to be fulfilled and Mary of all people was chosen to be the one to bring the Son of God into this world. And the angel answered and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One is to be born, will be called the Son of God. All the other descendants of David were at times in the Scripture called sons of God because they belonged to the line of David. And their earthly relations qualified them to be sons like adopted by faith into the family of God. You and I can be adopted into the family of God by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And when we're adopted as children of God, he would call us his sons and daughters in faith. But we are not the Son of God, the only, only, only begotten Son of God. <laughs> I want to talk to you just a moment about that. Jesus has declared to be the Son of God before Jesus is declared to fulfill David's kingship. Jesus is not the Son of God because he's a king. Jesus is king because he's the Son of God. Do you see the priority there, the order? A dog begets little dogs. A man begets human babies. When God begets Jesus, God begets God in the flesh. He begot His only begotten Son. And so He's the Son of God because He was begotten by God. Colossians 2.9 says, in, in, in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Luke 1.33, And He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and in His kingdom there will be no end. The child to be born would be called Holy, the Son of God. Holy means couple things. It means to be separated from the things of the world unto God. Holy also means without sin. He was without sin. He was separated from the ways of the world. He doesn't know the ways of the world. He's been around it. He was tempted in every way such as you and I are, but he never committed sin. In fact, he came to save sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15 says this is a Faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, said Paul. And I can say I feel like I'm chief. How about you? I feel so amazed that God would care about me and love me. And I know he does. The scripture tells me so. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Some men are so evil in their motives that they're fit only to be slaves and yet I reject slavery because I find that there are no men who are fit to be masters. Do you follow that? Many of us don't deserve to be in leadership. We all deserve to be subject absolutely to the authority and leadership of God himself. You know what we need? 
We need a holy king. We need a holy master. We need the Lord Jesus Christ to be Lord and deed of our life. So what kind of a king is Jesus? Well, the Bible says a number of things. He's holy. He's the son of God. He's Yeshua, the one God who is my salvation. He is eternal. He lives forever. Luke 133 says, that, 133 says, He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and in his kingdom there will be no end. That's eternal. It never ends. And Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit. It's important to understand the virginity of Mary because she was sexually pure. She was faithful to God and to her engagement. She wasn't pregnant already when the angel came and told her she was going to become pregnant. Jesus would be called Son of the Most High, so she would become impregnated by the Holy Spirit of God Himself, and He'll sit on David's throne, and he, His kingdom won't ever end. And how is that possible? With God, there is nothing impossible. So she submitted to that. Tonight, I got a message on the will of God. How do you know the will of God? If you want to, if you're willing to do whatever God tells you to do, then one of my questions is, how do I know God's will for me? You ever had that question? I want to know the will of God. I said, you know, if God would just write it on the wall and say, Pastor, <laughs> Pastor Rick, I want you to preach this text next Sunday. Uh, Monday, I want you to visit this person. Tuesday, I want you to do this. You're running out of room. Wednesday, I need you to do this. Thursday, I need you to do this. I would like to use that. I'd be over here taking notes and saying, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Unfortunately, he doesn't give me that specific moment by moment. Day by day, he gives me principles by which to live. So come tonight, because tonight's message is regarding how to know the will of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I know this is the will of God. He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, set apart to God, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that comes through this word of God. That you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, you want to know something about the message tonight? That's a, an appetizer right there. That, uh, how you know the perfect will of God. You know, Jesus, Jesus says you, can only, you, can only, you can't serve two masters. You can only serve one. you got to decide who's your master in your life. If Jesus is the Lord and the master, keep your eyes on him. Keep your ears open to his voice in the word. And Christians who have the faith of Mary, which is to say, I'm your servant, the answer is yes. Show me what to do, that's what I'll do. Please show me what to do. Any of you ever feel like you're just going through the motions in life? You're just going step to step to step, going...